All right, we continue talking about mainstream pop now. In the first video, uh, we talked about how the song is the important thing in, peri in the period before uh, 1955, and individual performances of it are done by performers who specialize in performing but mostly don't write their own songs. Frank Sinatra never wrote a song. Bing Crosby uh, never wrote a song, but nobody held that against them or thought they were inauthentic because of it. That's just the way it is back in those days. A music business dominated by music publishers. So now the question arises, how did people actually gain access to this music? How do they find out about it? And in order to, to think about that, we have to start by imagining what America was like at the turn of the century at about 1900. Uh, one thing that was very different about America in those days is that it was much more regional, um, where um, uh, what happened in the South or the Southwest or the West Coast or the Industrial North was very different. And you really had no way of knowing immediately what was going on in those other parts of the country unless you actually went there and found out about it. Even newspapers uh, were kind of slow. There, of course, were tele it was telegraph and you could sort of uh, find out about things that way. But nevertheless, you kind of had to wait for news to get to you. What that did is it, is it kept regional cultures relatively intact. So when it comes to talking about styles, when we talk about folk music, we talk about country music, when we talk about blues music, we can talk about styles that are associated with certain cities. People know what Chicago blues is, or Memphis, or St. Louis. And the reason why those styles were able to stay distinct from each other is because those musicians would move from place to place, but mostly the audiences stayed the same. So we lived in a world where there were many more regional accents. But it didn't take long with the, de with the development of radio for us to begin to develop what you might think of as a, a national culture, especially a national culture for entertainment. And as I gave away just a minute ago, radio and the development of radio played a tremendously important role in establishing a kind of a national culture across America, where people um, in Los Angeles were able to hear the same kind of music that people in New York were hearing, and the people down on the farm uh, somewhere in Tennessee could hear the same people that peop the music that people in the big city in Detroit or Chicago were hearing. Uh, that starts to happen with the spread of radio. So what can we say about radio? Um, it's hard to imagine a world before radio. Actually, for most of us, it's hard to imagine a world before the internet, although I know I w there was one, I was there. Uh, but nevertheless, w what would a world before radio have been like? Well, radio was initially developed um, by a fellow by the name of Marconi, made his first important sort of experiment to show that you could do this thing of sending voices through the air uh, in 1895. The, the, the um, benefit of radio early on was thought to be two things. Like so many technologies, one of the benefits was thought to be military. Right? There's a great benefit in being able to sort of reach your troops out on the battlefield and be able to talk to them instantaneously without having to send messengers back and forth, right? So that's a real, it's amazing how many of the technologies that were developed in the 20th century were first developed as military technologies or space technologies. Uh, putting a man on the moon, we, we gained a lot of microchip technology that would have, that, that made the internet possible. The other thing that it was handy for radio was, and that is talking to ships at sea. So if you've got a ship that's way out at sea and you want to be able to communicate with it, radio is a very, very handy way of being able to do that. Uh, in fact, radio really started to make its first big impact in 1912 when the Titanic sank. And it was possible to send radio transmissions of what was happening on the Titanic back to New York uh, via a kind of radio uh, telegraph system, you know, the that kind of thing. And the guy sitting right at the desk taking down that information was a fellow by the name of David Sarnoff. David Sarnoff, it turns out, went on to have a career running RCA and developing the NBC radio networks. He became a very, very important figure and was there right from the beginning of this. People were amazed when the Titanic was going down that they were able to read newspaper reports. It seemed almost in real time. To them, this was almost like cable news happening immediately. They were there and it never happened before. And so radio started to get uh, very, very, uh, showed a lot of promise and by 1920 radio stations were popping up around uh, major cities. Um, by, 19, by the end of the 1920s radio networks had begun to uh, 
pop up in this country. And so NBC and um, CBS and other networks uh, were able to do things by using telephone wires so they could connect stations up, affiliates they were called, in all kinds of different cities, and then they could, sh they could play the same programming around to everybody at the same time. So imagine how impressed people would have been with this. They could be sitting in their home somewhere in suburban Chicago and hear the same performance that people in a, in a New York nightclub were hearing in real time as it was actually happening through the air on their radio set. Fantastic, right? So these, uh, th these networks get going by connecting up all of these stations, these affiliate stations, and then by connecting in certain stations that were called super stations. Super stations could broadcast a very, very powerful signal, especially after the sun went down, that could reach whole regions of the country. So by putting these super stations and these, and these, um, these network affiliate stations connected by telephone lines together, you could reach from coast to coast. Fantastic. Who could imagine that, that, that radio could now reach a whole country at the same time? And when you do that, when everybody's listening to the same music at the same time, it means that they're, you're starting to break down regional differences. So what happens in popular music is through radio, it establishes a national audience. And what's on radio at this time? Well, you've got... Um, Soap operas, The Guiding Light was one of the early soap operas there. Comedies, Amos and Andy, though it would be seen as really, really politically incorrect by today's standards, Amos and Andy was, uh, was the, uh, one of the sort of great comedy shows of its day. Adventure shows like The Lone Ranger and Superman. Variety shows like one famous one that was hosted by Bing Crosby. And of course, music. Lots of music, lots of musicians playing music over the radio airwaves. So if you were one of these song publishers who wanted to get your song heard, get it out there so people could hear it, so then they could then buy the sheet music at the local five and dime and bring it home and play it on their home piano. What you want to do was get that song on the radio. So radio and the publishing business were in a sort of, uh, were, were working hand in glove to promote popular music in addition to the other kinds of things that radio was doing. Now you could also say that movies help provide a national audience because once a movie is made, The Wizard of Oz for example, everybody in every theater across the country is seeing exactly the same movie. And of course, people in the publishing business wanted to get their, movie, their songs placed in movies. Well, there was actually a bit of a debate about that because some people thought, well, if the song is placed in the movie, won't that kind of wear it out? Won't it have the sh same shelf life as the movie itself, like after the movie is no longer popular? The song will no longer be popular. You don't want that if you're in the publishing business. You want a song that's a, what they call an evergreen. It just continues to be used and used and used because every time it's used you make a little bit of money. So movies are important but they don't really happen in real time. Now the important thing we have to think about is that this fantastic music, this fantastic radio network uh, develops a national audience for music but after the Second World War David Sarnoff who I mentioned before gets this idea. If people will um, listen to music through the air. Think how much they would like to have music and pictures through the air. So at the end of the Second World War, he takes all of our, well, a lot of RCA's re research and development money and puts it into television. Television's going to be the next big thing, which leaves radio after a few years, really as a kind of an also ran. But we have all these fantastic radio stations that have been developed over the course of the 30s and 40s with all kinds of equipment. What's going to happen to those stations? Well, when we start talking about rhythm and blues in country and western music, we'll talk about what happens to those radio stations after they've been, well, not really abandoned, but at least partially abandoned by some of the big money which goes to television. But next, what we need to talk about is what did the music sound like during this period? Who were some of the most important artists in this period of American pop before 1955?